So aqueous human hemodynamics is, is, is the study of the physiologic factors that influence intraocular pressure. And uh, it's been an area that's, that's of um, particular interest at Mayo Clinic for, for a long time. Uh, my predecessor, Dr. Richard Brubaker, was one of the pioneers in the research. And uh, I've been trying to carry on in, in his, um, um, uh, since his retirement. Um, and uh, the, the reason it's important is because uh, intraocular pressure, as, as everyone um, knows, is the main risk factor for, for glaucoma and blinding disease of the eye. And the reasons why intraocular pressure is higher in some individuals, why it varies uh, over the course of the day, is really not well known. And the study of aqueous hemodynamics, the factors that control intraocular pressure, allows us to try to understand that. So um, there's, a, there's a few areas that, um, that we've been uh, focusing on. Um, with aqueous hemodynamics, it really takes a physiologic or really an engineering approach to, to fluid flow within the eye. So we like to measure the rate of fluid production. Uh, we want to measure the resistance to fluid outflow. We want to measure the back pressure called episclerovenous pressure. And then there's actually some secondary pathways for fluid outflow called uveal scleral outflow. And so we want to try to look at all of these factors and see how they influence uh, intraocular pressure. So um, one, of the, one of the areas that has been uh, uh, investigated extensively um, by, uh, by Dr. Brubaker during his career was looking at aqueous humor uh, production. And um, aqueous humor production, he found, that actually decreases by about half at nighttime when people go to sleep. Um, but uh, what actually happens to pressure at night is it actually goes up. And that's always been a little bit of a mystery. So one of the areas that we've been looking at recently is uh, trying to find out what other things change that, to cause intraocular pressure to go up at nighttime. Um, so we've actually needed to develop a number of instruments to allow us to do that because the, the instrumentation to measure these other parameters in aqueous hemodynamics were not um, or not uh, adequate. So in particular, we've been looking at developing instruments to measure episclerovenous pressure, this back pressure in the eye. Um, the, uh, the techniques and devices that existed in the past were uh, very subjective and, and produced answers that were, um, that were uh, confusing. Um, but um, we've, um, at Mayo Clinic, we've developed uh, a device that allows us to uh, produce um, uh, very objective measurements of episclerovenous pressure. And uh, what we've found um, is that um, um, when we take those measurements combined with the other measurements, we find that uh, uh, the, uh, the resistance to outflow actually decreases slightly at nighttime, I'm sorry, increases slightly at nighttime. Um, and the, the secondary pathway for fluid flow, the uveal scleral outflow pathway, actually shut down, shuts down almost completely at nighttime. And that, that's actually what produces this, this rise in intraocular pressure uh, during, the day, during the nighttime compared with during the daytime. So that was, um, that was really our first uh, main application of some of the new devices that we've been developing. Our, where we're focusing on, on now is, is a collaborative effort to um, look at the uh, genetic responses to uh, some existing glaucoma medications. Uh, so there's a, a number of different classes of medications that can be used for treatment of glaucoma. Um, most of them um, work uh, well when you look at a, a, a large uh, cross-section cross of the population. Um, but uh, when you look at individual patients, um, some people respond very well, other people don't respond at all, and, and right now we don't have a good way of predicting who's going to respond, who won't respond. So um, in this collaborative effort, we're going to look at what are the factors in aqueous human dynamics that may allow us to try to uh, predict this, and also looking and combining that with genetics to look at what are the genetic variables that make some individuals more likely to respond to medications as opposed to others. So that's, that's uh, work that is uh, ongoing um, and uh, it's been funding, funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, and then, uh, so <clears throat> one other, um, one other uh, area of interest uh, for us is, is um, again, focusing on aqueous hemodynamics, looking at episclerovenous pressure. 
because it hasn't been, um, the ability to measure it well hasn't existed in the past, um, and we've just recently developed the ability to measure it well, uh, what we can start to do is, is look at, uh, first of all, some of our existing treatments, because our existing treatments, we, uh, the, how ex exactly how they work is, is only partially understood, so we don't really know if our existing treatments affect episclerovenous pressure. Um, more importantly, though, is we can start to look towards the future and start to uh, think about novel therapies that may directly target episclerovenous pressure. Um, and now that we have the ability to measure changes in that parameter, uh, it's actually a very exciting time.